While there's growing recognition of the ocean's potential as a powerful source of solutions to mitigate and adapt to climate change, much remains to be done to accelerate and scale up ocean-based climate action. Today, we're going to talk about mangroves, these extraordinary salt-tolerant trees with one foot on land and one in the ocean. I'm absolutely delighted to be hosting this ocean podcast as a collaboration between Afikra and Community Jamil. My name is Heather Coldway, and I'm a marine conservationist who leads the Bertarelli Foundation's Marine Science Programme based at the Zoological Society of London. I'd li like to start by introducing my guest, Maisha Ahmad. Maisha, welcome. Hello, Heather. Um, good morning and absolutely excited um, to be here. Thank you very much and uh, very delighted to talk about mangrove. Um, which is uh, one of the most um, important um, uh, factor in the climate change scenario at the moment. And I am um, very lucky to be working at the uh, interface between science and um, practice, uh, very closely working with the communities in the um, coastal area in the southern part of Bangladesh. Fantastic. And we've both been lucky to spend time uh, in the Sundarbans in, in Bangladesh. Um, perhaps to give some context, that is the largest mangrove forest in the world and just this incredible ecosystem, but also a very dynamic place where many communities depend on the mangroves and associated uh, fisheries, etc., for their livelihoods. Um, it's also a, a mangrove forest that spans between India and Bangladesh. And in India, community Jamil has worked um, in this ecosystem to really help um, over 10,000 families rebuild their lives after a series of cyclones and extreme weather events. Um, this is a real challenge that we're facing right now with climate change, the increased in unpredictability um, and severity of storms and the impact those have on communities. And so we need to look at how we adapt to climate change. And that's something that Community Jamil has led uh, by building and supporting more resilient livelihoods and protecting and restoring mangroves. Can you um, just tell me a little bit more about what mangroves actually do, these sort of little coastal trees uh, to help coastal communities? Around um, 3 million people are actually living along, along the coastal uh, part of the Bangladesh region only. And 7.5 million are dependent on uh, directly and indirectly on the Shundurban ecosystem. That's a huge ecosystem we are talking about. That's just Bangladesh's part, right? Shundurban literally translates to a beautiful forest. It adds beauty to not just the ecosystem, but the life of the people. The greatest um, benefit of, of such trees is that it protects the coastal area from um, climatic hazards, mostly from cyclone, um, uh, water logging, um, tidal surges, you name it, um, which are uh, most uh, vulnerable uh, climatic hazards in the coastal areas. Um, uh, the uh, mangroves are also a uh, the 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 best um, of space for the biodiversity, right? Uh, in the Bangladesh's part alone, there are around two thousand different species of plants and animals thriving. So it's human, it's plants, it's um, uh, flora, fauna, and it's it's a um, beautiful natural way of water management as as well. The culture that exists surrounding uh, the mangroves in the uh, in the coastal part, um, uh, our our music, our culture, our myths, our stories are very much influenced by uh, the mangrove itself. So it is it is the source of life for them. You have talked about the uncertainty surrounding the climate change scenario. Yes, it uh, it is very much impacting how people look at um, uh, the mangroves at the moment. Um, they are a uh, savior more than ever, but also um, uh, economic devastation uh, is an issue. How do we then define or redefine mangroves at this point? And that's where also uh, the gender perspective comes in. Who takes the responsibility of the Shundurban ecosystem? I want to sort of explore that in the importance of women empowerment and involvement um, a little bit more. We're, Women are often marginalised from certain efforts, particularly um, conservation and restoration efforts, which can sort of push women out of some of their natural livelihoods. So where do you see and, and what 
examples have you seen of the women and uh, and how if with a bit of a, a chance and, and an opportunity and, and their voices being heard, we can actually uh, see that difference from involving them versus marginalizing them? Women has uh, shown um, exceptional um, resilience um, to this whole system as well as um, intelligence um, and acceptance, right? Uh, especially in these areas which are very, very vulnerable to climate um, um, you know, crisis. There is no doubt that uh, climate um, uh, affects uh, very um, uh, differently men and women. But then how um, the climate is being uh, um, dealt with is also very different from men and women, right? And women were not just um, living and thriving in the ecosystem, but they're actually also very much actively uh, deciding on very important factors like uh, the nutrition in the family, for example. Women have to make sense of that uh, ecosystem. So um, uh, trying to make or grow ownership uh, of that uh, mangrove with the women has been very successful uh, because of how, uh, you know, uh, women feel uh, uh, about nurturing uh, uh, the nature along with their day-to-day -day life. Um, yet we find ourselves talking about uh, local knowledge, cultural culture, um, anthropology, and, and all of the things that are actually driving protection in, in the Sundarbans and, and 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 elsewhere. But these voices are not at you know the big international tables. Then they're, they're not interacting with big business. They're they're very much doing things um, in the way that they've done. And we know that the best protected areas in the world are are managed through local indigenous peoples or through local communities. So how how do you think we should be working to increase awareness of where solutions lie, which are often in the hands of local communities or indigenous people. You have uh, made an important uh, point about thinking like an engineer, which is yeah. very, very challenging part because we unfortunately only understand numbers. Yeah, 50 acres of land planted, put the uh, mangroves there. In five years of time, it should be able to sequest certain amount of carbon. Yes, targets are nice, but it's really important to understand uh, the, the bottom up story as well. Awareness needs to be within us as well, us as practitioners, us as uh, scientists, us as scientific community, um, and those who are uh, designing the project as much as um, the um, local communities. Yeah. I think we are moving towards a new shift there with much greater awareness about this issue, but always a, a long way to go. The other challenge you touched on at the beginning about the, the Sundarbans is it's it's not just how Bangladesh chooses to do it, but this is a forest that doesn't recognise international borders or boundaries, nor do the fish that swim between it. But it is a forest that encompasses it, it is is in both India and Bangladesh. So how does that geography um, and the different national priorities play out in the single ecosystem? And what are the challenges there? A very uh, challenging part of, of uh, all the efforts of adaptation actually um, lies in this very fact that um, the forest or uh, the nature doesn't really recognize um, the border. Bangladesh and India uh, um, has a lot, um, as we speak, we are having a lot of efforts from not just the government side, but also the NGOs, the civil organizations, the local communities, all are working, trying to work hand in hand um, uh, to protect the mangrove equally, right? But still, um, um, the national priorities, the um, economic uh, development carve, um, all these are um, different um, critical aspects that kind of drives how uh, the forest is actually managed uh, this side of the border to that side of the border. Uh, from 2011 onwards, there is an MOU signed between um, uh, the government of uh, India and Bangladesh on the conservation of Shundarban. But still, although there are um, uh, efforts, um, great policies in place, but in terms of implementation, and that's the challenge of, of centuries, right? Um, we, we talk about, we can put policies in place and numbers in place, but what do, does those number mean, actually mean on ground if you are not following that? And if you, if both the governments are coming together to unfortunately um, break both the laws, 
uh, then that's um, uh, efforts from um, local communities, civil organizations, NGO would mean only so much. So, um, um, however, uh, I would say that uh, there are, from the scientific aspect, from the uh, academia, um, there is a huge uh, positive um, and commendable um, efforts to understand uh, the ec uh, ecosystem and the culture. Um, there is a beauty in, in uh, synchronizing uh, the culture and the music. I always talk about it because there is so much information uh, in our um, you know, stories and folklores and myths uh, that needs to be decoded to understand the climate uh, consequences over centuries in the Shundurban. Only if we understand the uh, historic consequences, we would then uh, be able to better understand the present and then better uh, design the future, right? I love the idea that perhaps people who haven't traditionally seen themselves as having a role to play, that we're all part of the solution and actually coming from different backgrounds and perspectives is, is so important. But let's zoom out um, as, as it's very timely for us to have this conversation. Um, we're about to head into the 28th Conference of the Parties to really look at how the world's addressing climate change. What's your hopes for COP28? COP is always about um, making sense of, of um, uh, how much are we um, uh, uh, capable of, of protecting uh, and who is responsible, who should take the responsibility and how much uh, could we protect and uh, restore or uh, combat, right? Um, uh, as much as uh, we are hopeful um, uh, that, um, yes, at the very end, uh, it took 28 cops to talk about mangroves, uh, but we are talking about it. That's that's. A, a good start. We are talking about it. We are. Uh, we have uh, pushed uh, um, the international community. The 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 scientists have put a lot of effort to bring all these conversations in this very important platform. Uh, again, uh, how much uh, should we give um, uh, importance to adaptation versus mitigation? That is a very important and critical conversation that needs to be understood and heard of in the COP conversations regarding mangroves, because when we talk about mangroves or nature-based solution in the global north versus global south, we are talking about really different perspectives here. Thank you. That's um, a lot to think about, but a lot to take out of this conversation. I think as two scientists from the global north and the global south with a, a shared passion for environment and people. I think we need to share that message to, to others listening um, that we hope the message of hope and optimism um, is shared, but also an urgency of, of time and recognising how every day people are living with the consequences of climate change. Thank you, Hithar, for, for making me think, rethink uh, and appreciate everything we have at the moment. Thank you for reminding me that lots of my hope and optimism comes from time working in Bangladesh with inspiring Bengali people. So thank you.